Good afternoon, everyone. I love the buzz of, uh, of conversation and greetings that's happening here in the room. Uh, welcome to faculty, staff, students, and friends. I'm Bill McGovern. I'm the interim dean of the law school. And I'm here to welcome you to this great occasion, the investiture of a named professorship today. Mitch Zamoff, Assistant Dean of Experiential Education and Clinical Professor, as the J. Stewart, Class of 40, and Mario Thomas McClendon, Professor in Law and Alternative Dispute Resolution. Uh, at the conclusion of the lecture, we're going to have a reception to celebrate Mitch uh, upstairs in our back commons. So down the hall to the elevator you came in, up the fancy staircase, and under the Liechtenstein, and there's where the reception will be. Um, and I hope you can all join us for that. An investiture of a named professorship gives us all the opportunity to celebrate our faculty and their contributions and successes in research, in teaching, and in service. That's core to our work at Minnesota Law, and Mitch really is exemplary in all three. Uh, and we're so grateful to him for that. The name professorship in this case, uh, the J. Stewart and Thomas, uh, Mario Thomas McClendon Professorship in Law and Alternative Dispute Resolution, was created in 2000 to establish an endowed professorship in law and ADR. This generous gift built on the McClendon's previous support for a variety of ADR-related activities at the law school, including adjunct faculty, research support, and course development. J. Stuart McClendon was an internationally recognized authority uh, on uh, arbitration and dispute resolution. He worked as assistant general counsel of Exxon Corporation and as a counsel at Satterley and Stevens in New York City. He received his BA from the University of Minnesota in 1937 and his JD from us here at the law school in 1940. He was also the son of Professor Jesse McClendon, who was a chemist, zoologist, and physiologist, as a longtime faculty member here at the university. Mario, his spouse, was also a, a University of Minnesota grad, graduating from the design school in 1941. Uh, the McClendons endowed this gift, along with significant funding from Mr. McClendon's employer, and continued to give to the law school until their passing in 2010 and 2011. Since then, their daughter, Janet McClendon Vasquez, along with her spouse, Alan, also both attorneys, uh, had, have continued her, her parents' legacy in supporting this fund and all of the work it does uh, to, to fund ADR here. Uh, Janet couldn't be with us here today, but Let's thank her and her family for their continued ongoing support of our incredible faculty and our efforts in ADR. Here at Minnesota Law, the chair was most recently held by Professor Laura Cooper, who also joins us here today uh, and held it until her shift to emeritus status. Today, it's my pleasure to formally install my terrific colleague and friend, Mitch Zamoff, who's, as I said, Assistant Dean of Clinical Education, uh, sorry, don't tell Steve I did that. <laughs> Assistant Dean of Experiential Education and Clinical Professor, um, as, as the J. Stewart and Mario Thomas McClendon Professor of Law and Alternative Dispute Resolution. Congratulations, Mitch. Professor Zamoff completed his BA and his JD from the University of Virginia. We don't hold that against him, however. <laughs> he served as an assistant US attorney in Philadelphia, including as deputy chief of the firearms unit. He is also the former executive vice president and general counsel of a little business here called United Health Group, and the former executive vice president and chief legal officer of its health benefits business. Prior to joining our faculty on a full-time basis, Professor Zamoff was a litigation partner at Hogan Lovells, where he co-founded the firm's Minneapolis office. He joined the law school full-time in 2017, at first as an associate clinical professor of law. Since then, he has done so much. He co-directed the Law in Practice program. 
He served as the litigation program director. He currently chairs our concentration in civil litigation, and he worked to spearhead efforts to create our new alternative dispute resolution concentration, which will become effective next year. In 2022, he was promoted to clinical professor of law and became our first ever assistant dean of experiential education. In that role, he has been overseeing significant expansion of our efforts in ADR and in experiential education, including coming up on tripling the number of uh, independent field placements our students have in organizations and companies around the Twin Cities. He also teaches alternative dispute resolution, not surprisingly, civil procedure, evidence, evidence drafting, law and practice, and our undergraduate introduction to American law class. He's a two-time and very well-deserved recipient of the Stanley V. Kenyon Teacher of the Year Award. He also founded and co-directed the law school's community mediation clinic. And outside the law school, he's a national expert in ADR, where he's a former member of the American Arbitration Association's Board of Directors, Leadership Council, and Healthcare Advisory Council. He frequently presents and writes about issues related to arbitration law and practice, and uh, his remarks today are going to be drawn from that significant body of scholarship. In addition, I have to say that not only has Mitch won the Kenyon Award for his skill as a teacher, but he is among the most popular teachers in the law school, as well as being an extraordinarily friendly colleague, and if I might say so, a rather snappy dresser. <laughs> he also serves the university as a hearing chair for the University of Minnesota Sexual Misconduct Hearing Committee and a member on the Campus Committee on Student Behavior, which are really important and often very uh, challenging roles. And we appreciate all of these many disparate things that Mitch does for our community here. Today, we're all going to have the benefit of his wisdom and knowledge as he gives this appointment lecture entitled Proposed Guidelines for Arbitral Disclosure of Social Media Activity. This article, which was published in the Cardozo Journal of Conflict Resolution, was recognized as the best scholarly article of 2023 on ADR by the Alternative Dispute Resolution section of the Association of American Law Schools. So, some of you know, we typically present a gift during an investiture. Mitch was able to come up and gesture at these snappy but very heavy bookends. <laughs> Uh, which I hope will adorn your uh, bookshelves and hold together volumes of exciting work about ADR. Thank you. <clears throat> so friends, family, students, everyone here, please join me in congratulating and welcoming Professor Mitch Samoff. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dean McGovern, and thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative of this honor, and I'm truly grateful to be a member of the Minnesota law community. Um, this definitely was not the award I dreamed about winning when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> I, I am proud that the leading scholars in alternative dispute resolution believe that it made a meaningful contribution to the field. Um, but I really haven't been able to bask in the glory of this moment for very long because of the blunt, bruising, un-Minnesotan feedback I've received from my non-law friends about this project. Rather than engage with the article's full 68 pages and almost 400 footnotes, <laughs> they haven't gotten past the title. <laughs> because while it may be good enough for AALS, Apparently, my project is a total dud from an entertainment perspective. I've taken that feedback to heart, and today, in the spirit of spreading my ideas more broadly than the legal community, I'm going to unveil for the first time three concepts to inject Hollywood-style pizzazz to propose guidelines for arbitral disclosure of social media activity. The big reveal will happen later in the program, and I welcome your feedback. So I do most of my research and writing in the field of alternative dispute resolution, or ADR. Uh, there are more than 20 specific types of ADR that are practiced, 
But these are the three primary methods of ADR. Uh, ironically, even though law school curricula focus on the resolution of disputes in court, featuring classes on court rules and procedure, evidence, trial practice, the vast, 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 three vasts, right? More than 90% of legal disputes, and all disputes for that matter, are resolved using one of these three uh, techniques. That's true not just for civil disputes, but it's also true for criminal disputes, most of which are resolved through plea bargaining, which is, of course, a form of negotiation. That's why the development of law and ethics and best practices in the field of ADR is so critical. ADR is the go-to form of dispute resolution in the United States and the world, and its use is on the rise. I come to this work not just as someone who studies and attempts to influence the law in this area, but as a professor who cares very deeply about arming our students with the tools to successfully navigate this space, and also as a practicing arbitrator and mediator who believes very strongly in the power of ADR to resolve disputes more efficiently, uh, more collaboratively, more durably, and more satisfactorily than litigation. Why is there a pile of rocks on this slide? I don't really know. I was suggested by the PowerPoint program, and it seemed kind of deep, so I just went with them. <laughs> Hope it had that effect on you until I ruined it. Um, so this paper is about arbitration. Uh, that's a process that's familiar to some of you, probably not so familiar to others. Um, it's hard to define it because it takes many different shapes and sizes, but this definition works pretty well to describe what the process is. Um, any workable definition of arbitration requires agreement of the parties. The parties have to agree to take their dispute away from the court forum and into the arbitration forum. And thus today, I'm not talking about, and I don't talk about in my article, situations where consumers or employees enter into agreements with arbitration provisions that are allegedly forced on them. What I'm talking about here in this project is the many more straightforward situations where the parties definitely and clearly want to arbitrate instead of litigate. Now, arbitration has many advantages over litigation, which is why it's getting traction and why its use is on the rise. It's more customizable than litigation. The parties can pretty much dream up any process they want to employ. Uh, it's proven to be less costly and more efficient than litigation. It's less public than going to court, which might be attractive to certain kinds of disputants in certain kinds of situations. Arbitral awards are more difficult to overturn on appeal, so there's more finality around arbitral decisions, and they're much easier to work with and enforce internationally than decisions of a court. But the advantage of arbitration that I want to focus on today, and which is the relevant advantage to my, my piece, is the fact that arbitration is more democratic than going to court, in that parties actually have a say in who the decider of their dispute will be. They have input into who the arbitrator will be. This is usually done when the parties either agree on who the arbitrator will be, or when they work from a list of arbitral candidates and strike and rank those candidates until they get down to an arbitrator who will be acceptable to both parties. And studies have shown that parties who go through arbitration typically have greater satisfaction with that process than they do with litigation. And one of the reasons they talk about repeatedly is this democratic element to arbitration, the ability to weigh in on the selection of the arbitrator. The parties might prefer an arbitrator who has certain kind of expertise that they don't think a judge or jury will have. The parties may think that it's helpful to have an arbitrator with certain experiences or traits or skills that they don't think a judge or jury will have. And most relevant to this piece, um, the parties get to screen their arbitrators for conflicts of interest in a way that parties that go to court don't. Right? So we hear a lot in court about drawing a good judge or a bad judge, just depending on the assignment wheel that comes up. That happens less in arbitration, because the parties have the ability to know the conflicts of interest that arbitral candidates might possess and not choose them if they're concerned about those conflicts of interest. How do they make these decisions about which arbitrators to select? 
it's based on disclosures that arbitrators make to the parties and the lawyers who are involved in the arbitration. Arbitration parties typically know the professional backgrounds of the arbitral candidates they're choosing from, and really relevant to the issue I'd like to discuss today is they get disclosures from arbitrator candidates about whether they have relationships with the parties, the lawyers, and the witnesses who are involved in the arbitration, so the parties and lawyers can consider that information in deciding whom to select. And my strong belief is that this benefit of arbitrator disclosure only is realized if those disclosures are robust, consistent, and have meaning to the parties and lawyers who receive them. <laughs> Concept one. Jennifer Lawrence is an arbitrator who fails to disclose a Facebook friendship with attorney Idris Elba in secret friendship. The discovery of their friendship turns their careers and the ADR world upside down. Um, what do arbitrators typically disclose to the parties and the lawyers who arbitrate? Um, this language from the American Arbitration Association's disclosure guidelines is very representative. By the way, AAA, the American Arbitration Association, is the leading arbitrator um, administration organization. They administer the most arbitrations in the United States. And they tell us, they tell arbitrators, that we have to tell parties and their lawyers about any relationship that we have with a party, a party's representative, that would normally be their lawyer, or a witness in the case. And we have to provide certain information about those relationships. But there's no questions currently in the AAA's questionnaire or any of the other administrators' questionnaires about social media connections between the arbitrator and the participants in the arbitration, even though arbitrators are using social media more and more to connect with people both in the professional and their personal lives. And there's no guidance at all today about whether a social media connection uh, equals a relationship or whether any social media connection equals a relationship for purposes of these disclosure rules. There also is nothing in any of the statutes or ethical codes that arbitrators follow that tells us what to do with our social media connections. So we, we, arbitrators, all neutrals, are forced to decide whether to disclose their social media connections based on general disclosure guidelines that exist for all relationships, whether in social media or not. And unfortunately, this patchwork of disclosure rules and regulations isn't very clear outside of the social media context and is even more muddled in this newer form of relationship. The leading statutes, the Federal Arbitration Act, which governs all arbitrations across the country that have an interstate element, doesn't tell us what to disclose. Neither does the Uniform Arbitration Act, which has been adopted by many states. The newer revised Uniform Arbitration Act gives us this standard. It says that we're supposed to make a reasonable inquiry and disclose any facts that a reasonable person would consider likely to affect our impartiality. So ask yourself, if an arbitrator was a Facebook friend, for example, with the lawyer on one side of an arbitration, would that be likely to affect the arbitrator's impartiality in the eyes of a reasonable person? The landscape's complicated because there are other standards that also apply to arbitrators. The leading code of ethics that apply to arbitrators says that we have to disclose relationships which might reasonably affect our impartiality in the eyes of the parties. So now we're moving from a reasonable person perspective to the eyes of the parties perspective. Might it affect my impartiality in the eyes of one of the parties if I was a Facebook friend with the lawyer on the other side of the case or the party on the other side of the case? And if we get down to the rules of the arbitration administrators, they impose still different standards circumstances that give rise to a justifiable doubt about our impartiality or independence. It's a tough environment to navigate even outside of the social media space. There are also cases out there that have been decided in this area that also don't provide a very clear pathway forward. If an arbitration party loses an arbitration, 
and they think that the arbitrator did not disclose a relationship with the winning party that should have been disclosed, they can move to vacate that arbitral award under the Federal Arbitration Act or state statutes. And they're making the argument in that case that there was evident partiality on the part of the arbitrator. This can be an undisclosed relationship with an arbitration participant. And there's a lot of cases out there in the federal and state level that speak to this issue, but only one that's been decided by the Supreme Court. That decision came over 50 years ago in a case called Commonwealth Codings. And that case yielded two different opinions, a plurality opinion and a concurring opinion that are followed by different circuits, depending on where you are in the country, with different disclosure standards. Justice Black's opinion says that arbitrators should disclose all relationships that might create an impression of possible bias, pretty low threshold for disclosure. Justice White's concurring opinion is a little bit higher, which says that all relationships should be disclosed that a reasonable person would conclude compromise the arbitrator's impartiality. Again, arbitrators need to navigate the statutes, the ethics rules, the ABA uh, and AAA administration rules, and this, this patchwork of case law in deciding whether their social media connections should be disclosed. Concept two. In hidden connection, a LinkedIn connection between arbitrator Michelle Yao and witness Issa Rae is not discovered until after a high stakes arbitration has been decided. The battle that follows will change their lives and shake the foundation of ADR practice across the globe. <laughs> now my hypothesis in undertaking this research project was that arbitrator disclosures about social media connections are inadequate and wildly inconsistent. Um, anecdotally, my experience was telling me in the matters I was considered for and selected for as an arbitrator that most arbitrators were not addressing the social media piece at all in their disclosures, and those that were were doing so um, in a rather cursory, superficial way and in an inconsistent way. And so what I decided to do was to test my hypothesis by developing some disclosure standards, some um, scenarios, some hypothetical disclosure scenarios, and share them with a focus group of arbitrators and a focus group of lawyers to see what they would do in that situation and what they would expect in that situation. Um, I believe strongly in pressure testing uh, research ideas with lawyers and neutrals who are in the field encountering these issues in their practices because just because I have a hypothesis about something doesn't mean that it is so. So I've had the benefit of working with a group of about 20 arbitrators and mediators and about 20 attorneys who are kind enough to give me feedback on my research ideas to make sure that the ideas will be relevant and impactful. I'm sharing with you three of the uh, disclosure hypotheticals that I developed for this uh, focus group universe. Um, arbitrator A uses social media a lot. Um, over a three year period, he liked some posts that were made by lawyers uh, and law firms who were gonna be in an arbitration that he was being considered for, even though he wasn't a Facebook friend or a LinkedIn connection of any of the, the people or firms whose content he liked or commented on. Should arbitrator A disclose the fact that he liked the content of these arbitration participants in his disclosures? Arbitrator B is a pretty free, freewheeling linked inner. He, uh, she kind of links in uh, with whoever sends her connect requests and she's uh, pretty liberal about connecting with other lawyers. In this scenario, she is linked in. She is a connection with one of the lawyers who's in a case that she's being considered for, but it's not someone who she's met in person. Should this arbitrator disclose to the parties and lawyers that she is a LinkedIn connection of one of the lawyers in the arbitration? And my third hypothetical is about blogs, microblogs like X. And the question here is um, an arbitrator posts a lot on X and one of the lawyers who's involved in the arbitration reposts their content. I don't know if you call it retweets anymore. Is it re-Xing? I don't even know what you call it when you re-X somebody. But um, 
someone out there, a lawyer who's involved in an arbitration that the arbitrator is being considered for is reposting their content, uh, is that something that the arbitrator should disclose to the parties and the lawyers involved in the arbitration? So I took this to a group of arbitrators, I took it to a group of lawyers, and here's what I found. Um, the arbitrator focus group um, did uh, confirm my belief that arbitrators don't disclose this stuff very much. They don't look for it even to disclose it, and when they do, they do it in different ways. Um, the vast majority of my arbitrator focus groups would not have disclosed any of the information that was included in those hypotheticals or most of the hypotheticals that I presented to them. Their belief was that they know if a social media connection of theirs is significant or not, and they should have the discretion to tell the attorneys and parties when something is significant and when it is not. A very small handful had made any social media disclosures at all. Now, I should say these results did not surprise me very much, um, and I think one of the reasons it's so important to shed light on this issue is that most arbitrators don't have any incentive to surface the issue up themselves, uh, because the reality is that arbitrators have an economic incentive not to make disclosures. Uh, arbitrators get paid to arbitrate. They want to get selected for arbitration cases, and disclosures are quite frankly bad for business because, you know, if a party has five or 10 or 15 potential arbitrators to choose from, it is typical for them to just eliminate any candidate who reports a connection with a party or lawyer on the other side of the case. So it's not shocking to me then that many arbitrators are dismissive of the importance of their social media connections because disclosing them might mean that they don't get work. The problem with that is that attorneys think this stuff is very important in vetting arbitral candidates. So when I went over to my attorney focus group, every attorney uh, who I interviewed thought that it would be helpful to know that information in all three of the scenarios that I laid out, as well as other scenarios I presented them to, and they expected disclosure in several of the hypotheticals I presented them with they all thought there was a lack of transparency uh, in this space. So I think this is a problem. I think this inconsistency in how arbitrators approach this space is a problem, and I think this trend towards non-disclosure is a problem. Um, what's happening out there in arbitration land is that when parties lose arbitrations, they, the first thing they're doing is investigating their arbitrators to see whether or not they had any undisclosed relationships with the parties or witnesses or lawyers on the winning side. And if they find any of those relationships, what they're doing is going to court to overturn the arbitration award based on evident partiality. And we're seeing more and more of this litigation cropping up in state and federal courts. And so it would be very protective of arbitral awards for arbitrators to be more disclosive. We also have a really upside down marketplace right now for arbitral services because the arbitrators who are more disclosive and transparent about their social media connections to the arbitration participants get punished. They get eliminated from consideration because of their transparency, while the arbitrators who are scooting through and not disclosing this content because they don't believe it is important or significant are not facing the same repercussions. The other problem is that parties don't know what it means when an arbitrator doesn't disclose any social media connections in their disclosures. Does it mean that the arbitrator doesn't have any social media connections to the parties or the lawyers or the witnesses? Does it mean that they do have connections, but they just don't think they're important enough or material enough to disclose? Does it mean that they even searched their LinkedIn or their Facebook or their other platforms to see if there are any um, connections there? In today's environment, no one knows what a non-disclosure means. And I believe parties deserve consistent, reliable disclosures so they can realize one of the primary benefits of arbitration, which is the ability to participate in the selection of the neutral. So idea, um, create some guidelines. Some guidelines that arbitrators could follow around disclosing their social media connections. And that's what this project was all about, was developing those guidelines. 
Uh, it involved a pretty wonky dive into the scholarship on social media because you couldn't really do this platform by platform because platforms come and go and change all the time. So we had to develop the guidelines sort of category by category. And we did so with um, reference to the empirical research on how arbitrators and lawyers use social media. Right, so, so there's data that shows that arbitrators and lawyers are using certain types of social media more than others, and the guidelines were pointed to that sort of usage. The three core principles that we wanted to follow in creating these guidelines are as follows. First, if you follow the guidelines, you would be in compliance with the most rigorous disclosure rules that are out there in the case law, in the ethics codes, and in the statutes. Second, the guiding principle of the guidelines is that ongoing social media relationships with arbitration participants that arise out of the arbitrator's affirmative conduct should be disclosed. These are most akin to the types of relationships outside of the social media context that typically are disclosed. And finally, we needed to build something that could be used, especially by a, a community of arbitrators which tends to skew older and not as sophisticated in the use of technology. So we needed to impose research obligations that were practical and manageable in order to get buy-in to the regime that, that was being proposed. So, why did we think this was the right line to draw, right? Like reasonable people could disagree about where the line to draw is in terms of disclosure. Um, we think that um, the fact that an arbitrator took affirmative conduct to connect and stay connected with an arbitration participant on social media creates an appearance of partiality from the perspective of the parties. We think a party and their counsel would want to know if an arbitrator was connected on social media with the opposing lawyer or the opposing party or a witness that they were being asked to evaluate the credibility of. And of course, we confirm that with the work we did with the uh, focus group of lawyers. Um, even if an arbitrator is like, social media is not a big thing, I just connect with whoever you know, sends me a connect request, the fact that they've connected with someone in that arbitration is, makes it different, right? It makes that relationship different than if they're not connected to all the rest of the folks who are involved. And again, it seems like for arbitration to function at its highest level, there should be transparency around that type of information. If an arbitrator is like open season on LinkedIn requests, they can say that when they make their disclosure and then the parties and lawyers are armed with the information they need to make an intelligent decision about whether or not to select that arbitrator. So, social media. Uh, tough to develop guidelines that are workable in a very fluid social media space. So, what we did was we canvassed the literature that was out there and found that arbitrators tend to use three categories of social media. Social networks like Facebook, business networks like LinkedIn, and blogs and microblogs like X. They don't tend to be on TikTok that much. They don't tend to be on Instagram as much. And so the kind of video sharing, photo sharing platforms aren't as relevant to the behavior of arbitrators. Uh, it is true, of course, you know, you can use those sharing platforms to create relationships, right? You can follow each other on those platforms. That gives those platforms kind of a social networking element. But we focused on the traditional social networks, business networks, and blogs and microblogs. And mindful of the fact that our target audience were these older and not so social media sophisticated arbitrators, I went through each of the social media categories and applied the guidelines to typical behavior on these platforms in an effort to break down barriers and try to make disclosure intuitive and practicable and not intimidating uh, to the universe of neutrals who are out there. So here's my attempt to go through each of these three social media categories and I'll explain to you how the guidelines would suggest that an arbitrator should handle their activity on these platforms. Social networks, I'll use Facebook. An arbitrator should search for and disclose all of their Facebook friendships with the lawyers and witnesses and parties in a case. 
Uh, that requires affirmative conduct on the part of the arbitrator. To be a friend with somebody, you have to either make a friend request or accept it, and it results in an ongoing relationship. Also, an arbitrator should disclose if they follow the Facebook page or the equivalent of any arbitration participant. Again, I'm connected to that arbitration participant by view of the follow, and I took affirmative action to make it happen. On the flip side, if I'm just being an arbitrator on Facebook and someone follows my page and my privacy settings aren't set up so that I have to approve that, I didn't take any affirmative conduct to establish that relationship. So that fell on the non-disclosure side of the line. And likes and, excuse me, likes and comments on content also fell on the non-disclosure side of the line because even though the arbitrator is affirmatively liking or commenting on content, there's no stickiness there. There's no relationship there that seems to rise to the level of something that would create an impression of possible bias. Now, if the comment is like, I'm going to rule for all claimants in every arbitration, then yeah, like you've got a problem, but that's because of the content of the comment and not because of the relationship aspect. On LinkedIn, the lines are drawn in very much the same place. Arbitrators should search for and disclose their LinkedIn connections, right? They took affirmative action to link in with somebody on LinkedIn, and it establishes an ongoing relationship. They also should disclose if they follow the LinkedIn page of an arbitration participant, whether it's a law firm or a company or any other party or lawyer. But again, if the arbitrator or their firm is followed by somebody else in a way that they didn't have to expressly approve, that seems like something that doesn't have to be disclosed. By the way, that type of passive activity is very tough to search for and find on social media platforms as well, which would create a barrier to compliance for most arbitrators. And then finally, um, for the blog and microblog space, uh, if an arbitrator is following an arbitration participant on X or another platform, they should tell the parties and lawyers that. Uh, but if they are being passively followed by someone else, or if there's just episodic liking and commenting on content that's happening out there in the social media world, that seemed not to rise to the level of a disclosable relationship. Ready for concept three? Comes right after this. I was one slide off. Um, <laughs> happens all the time, my students will tell you. Um, so the other thing we did in the article was we tried to anticipate the fact that we can't anticipate you know, obviously certain social media platforms and categories that haven't been created yet. And so to, to create this aspect of durability, we came up with a catch-all provision which tries to encapsulate the whole um, essence of the approach, which is that, you know, if you can search for, and all these platforms are pretty easy to search for, you just have to type in the name of the law firm or the party or the lawyer who's involved. If you can discover an ongoing social media relationship as opposed to just a one-time episodic content that resulted from your affirmative conduct, you should disclose it. Concept three, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is a computer programmer, fantasy gamer, and part-time private detective who uncovers arbitrator Scarlett Johansson's acceptance of an Instagram follow request from attorney Ryan Gosling. Follow Me explores the dire consequences of an arbitrator's decision to keep her cards a little too close to the vest. So I will end today by applying my proposed guidelines to the hypotheticals that I propose to the focus groups because my main mission with this was to enhance social media disclosures, to make them more robust. I mean, reasonable minds can agree or disagree around where lines should be drawn on particular disclosure scenarios, but the important contribution, I hope, of these guidelines was to promote discussion in this space and to at least put forward a set of ideas and a set of rules that could make the space consistent and, and understandable and reliable from a disclosure standpoint. So, hypothetical one, unless the um, arbitrator had a disclosable relationship outside of social media, uh, social media, he shouldn't be required to disclose the fact that he has liked content posted, posted at some point by attorneys or law firms involved in an arbitration. 
It has one of the two elements. It has affirmative conduct, but it doesn't have an ongoing relationship. By contrast, arbitrator B should disclose the fact that she's a LinkedIn connection with someone who's involved in the arbitration. That connection has both elements, affirmative conduct by the arbitrator and an ongoing relationship on social media. If arbitrator B wants to tell the parties that she's connected to like 28,000 people on LinkedIn, she can do that. And the parties can consider that in deciding whether or not to uh, continue to consider her for their case. Finally, my hypothetical three, um, arbitrator C should not have to disclose the fact that some participant in an arbitration has retweeted their content uh, for two reasons. Arbitrator C did not do anything affirmative, again, assuming they don't approve that retweeting uh, based on their privacy settings. They didn't do anything to create that relationship affirmatively and a retweet or a comment or a repost doesn't really create an ongoing relationship. It's just like making a comment to somebody uh, out there on the street outside of social media. So in conclusion, here's the update on where the guidelines stand. Um, they're getting some traction, which has been gratifying. Uh, the American Arbitration Association is considering whether to incorporate them into their disclosure questionnaire. In fact, I'm presenting next month at a AAA uh, conference where they'll be getting feedback from their leadership about the implications of adding this to their disclosure protocols. And there's been organic acceptance of the guidelines in the arbitration space as well. Some arbitrators are following the guidelines. I know this because some people call me to make like disclosure rulings for them, which has been like a very poorly compensated side business that I'm developing here, which I wouldn't mind offloading. If any students would like to serve as assistants in this space, hit me up and we can talk about that. Um, I also know from my friends at AAA that arbitrators are, are referencing the guidelines and their disclosures. Um, it just seems like in the last year we're seeing more disclosure about social media connections in this space, which is good. And one other development that I'm really gratified by is that more lawyers and parties are specifically demanding this information when they're getting information about their arbitral candidates. And so hopefully that combination of organic awareness of the importance of this issue and demands coming from the users, the customers of arbitration, will create critical mass so that in a couple of years these kinds of disclosures have become commonplace. So that is the end of my prepared remarks. Um, I'm interested in whether you would go with secret friendship, hidden connection, or follow me. Um, and I'm also happy to hear your feedback and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So this should be a softball. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the day, the rules regarding disclosure can be shaped by the participants, I would assume, as you mentioned, lawyers can demand. And it's also notable, as you mentioned, that in the uh, focus groups, the lawyers wanted to know the information that you said shouldn't be disclosed, i.e. the likes. And I could certainly imagine why, if I'm a litigator, at the end of the day, you're looking for every possible advantage. Why not? So how, why isn't it the case that at the end of the day, the, the way that this will evolve is that the parties will want to demand even more information than you suggest should be demanded. Um, what, is there some uh, reason why lawyers may not do that? Or is there some reason why they sort of may settle on the proposed guidelines? Or are we sort of likely to see, at the end of the day, now that this issue has been surfaced, uh, a push from both sides to actually get maximal disclosure? So arbitration, they say, is a creature of contract, meaning that arbitrations are guided by the rules that the parties choose to agree to, right, that they choose to adopt. And I think lawyers have been hesitant to go beyond um, the normal disclosures they receive from arbitrators unless they have agreed with the other side on a more invasive protocol, if you will, because the rules of the game are the rules that the parties agree to. Um, the game changes somewhat when organizations like the American Arbitration Association get involved because they want to get more business, right, for their particular administrated arbitrations. So they've been more willing to agree to requests from parties and lawyers for additional information above and beyond what their arbitration agreement calls for in terms of arbitrator selection. So I agree with you that there, I think, will be some, I think, healthy push and pull around what the right amount of disclosure is. I mean, I'm pretty much in favor of total transparency in this space. Um, I actually believe that once social media disclosures become more commonplace, they're not going to be that interesting after a while because we're all just going to have a boatload of social media connections. And I think that you know, normalizing that kind of um, interaction is the way to kind of normalize the marketplace. Because right now, there's such electricity attached to these LinkedIn connections, which um, I don't think are all that electric in most cases. <laughs> I mean, maybe yours are. Maybe you have more electric LinkedIn connections than I do, but mine are pretty, pretty bland for the most part. Francis, did you have something? So partially out of ignorance, but I've got a hypothetical for you. If the two sides in the um, arbitration are not just Jane Doe and John Doe as individuals, but are really there representing organizations or larger groups. Um, I, I could see the issues might be a little different. And so my hypothetical, and you'll, you'll see why you like it, is let's say that one side is roughly UVA and the other side is roughly Virginia Tech. And they've agreed to some arbitration that has nothing to do with sports, but it turned out the arbitrator is a longtime member of the UVA Basketball Boosters Club. Now, that's not an individual, there's no individual connection at all. So there's no real sense of this as favoritism at an individual level. But I'm thinking more of like a psychological bias, you know, that there's just a, same way you go into a party, and if I met you and we were UVM, you'd hug me if I was a UVA grad, right? I think, right? I would hug you, um, Francis, yes. as, as, Not all UVA grads. So as I understand it, your guidelines would not require disclosure because they're really focused on the individual connections. And yet, if I was Virginia Tech in that context, and let's say you didn't, you know, there's no other way to know about this information, I'd be concerned. So I'm wondering if, when it's organizational, if there's sort of the calculus changes at all. Right. So I think if I was an, if I was an arbitral candidate in a case involving UVA and I followed UVA basketball on Twitter, or I followed UVA basketball on Instagram, I think I should disclose that because I am connected to the party in the organization on social media by my affirmative conduct. If the case involved just a professor from UVA against a professor from Virginia Tech, um, I don't think that at least the social media connection is triggered. But the parties know what school I went to. I mean, the parties typically have this information just in my professional biography. So if they're concerned about the kind of unconscious bias, or maybe not so unconscious bias, they can factor that in as part of their due diligence process. But to me, the issue would be if an organization is a party and I'm connected to the organization in some way through my affirmative conduct on social media, 
that's when I think the disclosure definitely should happen. Now, all the players in this space are supposed to, I think, you know, reflect on those general disclosure standards and disclose other situations that might create a reasonable impression of bias. And so maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, we'd see neutrals making additional disclosures. But I was, of course, just focused on the social media connectivity yeah, I there. It would affect how I would decide it. And I, I would totally disclose it and probably not even allow myself to be considered for it, but I probably have an unhealthy attachment to my alums basketball team. Yes? Just along that same vein, why put the burden on the arbitrators to disclose if there can be due diligence? I mean, a lot of the information that you're asking individuals to disclose would be publicly available, and so the lawyers could look up and find out who their friends are, presumably, who they're connected with on LinkedIn, and that would be fair game to exclude them, is that right? I think that due diligence is done, right, particularly in cases with well-resourced parties who have sophisticated counsel. I don't think everyone's privacy settings allow the general public to look into our social media and find out who our friends and connections are. And the rules and ethics code say arbitrators have an obligation to disclose it, right? So I think just from a transaction cost perspective, also from just a prophylactic perspective from the perspective of arbitrators to protect the durability of their awards, the burden is on arbitrators. The law has placed the burden on arbitrators to make these disclosures affirmatively. Believe me, the lawyers, especially in higher stakes cases, are out there doing their own research, which is another reason why it would be prudent for arbitrators to get over this burden and just be transparent at the front end. Time for one more, if there's one more, and then we can get to the food and drink portion of the program. Um, one quick question and one question. First of all, who's going to play you in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> didn't you see the? Didn't you see my proposed character in um, Follow Me? It oh, probably sorry. doesn't work, but they're bald. <laughs> He's bald at least. Um, so no other. Have you examples. have you thought about this in the context of judges and the rules that apply to judges in the use of social media versus arbitrators? I know, obviously, arbitrators are also business people out there trying to get the business. The judges are tenured the business comes to them. There is no decision about that. But um, arbitrators do op operate as quasi-judges, and there's so much arbitration is growing. And we may even start seeing it in the criminal sphere with mediation of plea bargains, for example. Um, is there perhaps an argument to be made that arbitrators, because of the role they're going to play, should be more circumspect about their social media? Presence. Right, so I guess if you had to disclose your social media connections, you either would want to disclose them to everyone and have everyone disclose them to everyone, right? So it demystified the connection, or you would just get off social media, right? And there are arbitrators and judges who are not on social media because they don't want any to have any connections to disclose. I thought about the judge piece a little bit. Um, it's just very, very difficult to recuse a judge for something like this, right? I mean, we don't know who they're connected to. They don't have to tell us who they're connected to. And so it takes a pretty extraordinary situation under the recusal statutes to get a judge off a case. So I don't know how to address that issue over on the court side. I think if arbitration addresses this issue more forthrightly and transparently, it can distinguish itself even more favorably from the judicial system, at least on this issue of, of bias. I think that's it, everybody, right? Thank you. Thank you.